Today we're going to be talking about mechanical ventilation and hopefully we can demystify this ventilator mystery that so many people have issues with. And my belief is that because there's so much jargon twisted around in all these things and respiratory therapists who are wonderful people, they do most of the work, but we don't get a chance to get our hands on the ventilator. And so what I want to do today is demystify all of that for you. So as we wait for a couple more people to jump on here, please let me know whether or not you can see me. And Priya says, yes, can hear you and see you. Matthew Miller says, yes, we see everything working. Um, Angel can't see anything, but that was probably from before when we were on a uh, dark screen. And I think I finally figured out the technical glitches. So I am super stoked about that because this is a format that I want to keep doing for all of you from here on. I think this is a good way to do lectures, not only because of COVID, but because this is a better way of doing education um, from the comfort of your own home and then taking the content, putting on the channel and live streaming it after. So if you're on and you feel chatty, why don't you chat me up in the comments? I can see everything here. And like I said, we'll just give it a minute or two more for a couple more people to jump on and then we'll get started with the lecture. I like to keep these lectures short. We're looking at 20, 25 minutes that we'll have a Q&A session. And, um, and, uh, yeah, and I'll answer anything that you got because I want you to walk away from this lecture truly knowing how to wrap your brain around mechanical ventilation. Todd Haber is here from Florida. It must be like a bazillion degrees down here because it's 84 degrees and totally humid and it's probably like 100 degrees up here in the studio, and I'm dying. And when I say studio, I mean the attic, which was painted and some lights put right there. All right, folks, let's do this. Let's talk about some mechanical ventilation here. So just to start off, just know that mechanical ventilation is not a new concept. The concept of the concept of giving people positive pressure ventilation in orifice has been going on for hundreds of years. It started way back with the Mayans who did uh, hallucinogenic leaves and they used to put it with a um, with an insufflator into the rectum and they thought it was a rite of passage to the afterlife. So positive pressure is not a new thing. Move forward to the 1700s, and this is where people were really starting to use positive pressure ventilation for resuscitation. And this is something they actually used to do. They used to take tobacco enemas and put them in the rectum and insufflate them after people were drowned. And this is where the terminology blowing smoke up your arse came from. Truly it is. Now, this is a practice for, for quite some time. So much time, in fact, that they came up with their own ACLS algorithm so that people would remember. Tobacco enema, breathe and bleed, keep warm and rub until you succeed, and spare no pains for what you do may one day be repaid to you. This is not something I would ever want repaid to me. Okay, this is probably where they had the first DNR that came from. Um, and it's uh, not, not do not resuscitate, it was do not rectalize at that point. But through time, they've made some adjustments. They did some studies, and they found during the polio epidemic, this was the first application of positive pressure ventilation. And during that time, they figured out the correct orifice to intubate, go through the cords, and this is where they first started doing true mechanical ventilation as we know it today. And back then, vents were very simple. They were just simply machines that pushed air in and then turned off and air would come out. But what happened over time is there was this crazy word soup of ventilator modes. And this has alienated people in terms of how they should be ventilating people. Is it APRV, PC, SIMV? What do all these words mean? What does this soup mean? Um, you might even have ventilators that look something like this, where there's just too many dials and buttons and you're afraid to go next to the machine. And I get it. But what I want to do for you today is completely dis demystify the ventilator. I want to show you just how simple mechanical ventilation is. And in fact, what I'd like to do is to give you a framework so that anytime, today, tomorrow, next week, 
when you get a new vent mode introduced to you, you may not know exactly what that vent mode does on face value, but if you use the systematic approach, you'll be able to know what that ventilator is doing. And so let's go back to the basics. Now for me, I'll be honest with you, mechanical ventilation when I started fellowship after five years of residency was still a mystery to me. The reason why it was a mystery was because Again, the word soup. I really didn't understand what these vent modes mean. I mean, I could nod my head when someone was doing a lecture on it, but I didn't truly understand what mechanical ventilation was. And I think it was like the third day of my fellowship. I went into my program director's office and I said, I don't understand mechanical ventilation. And so he reached under his desk and he put this, what you see on the screen, on the desk. And he says, I want you to take this home and this will explain everything that you need to know about mechanical ventilation. And I was psyched because now I could figure out what mechanical ventilation was. So I went home. I had this thing at home for a week and I came back a week later. I put it back on his desk and he goes, so I said, I have no idea what this thing even is or what to do with it. And so that was the beginning of my understanding of what mechanical ventilation was. And what he did was he said, this is a bellows for those of you who are not from New York City and don't you know, don't city dwellers. What this does is it blows air on a fire and you take this device and you basically squeeze it down and pushes air into something. And this is a mechanical ventilator. This is all a mechanical ventilator is. It is just a bellows device. Let me explain. If you take this device and stick it in someone's mouth and someone says, I would like 500 cc's of air, you could theoretically, if this was, let's say one liter of volume, you could go halfway and then just squeeze the air inside and that would be 500 cc's of a mechanical breath. You could say, well, I don't know, I like to use a pressure mode of ventilation. Well, you can hook up a manometer on the end and apply a certain amount of pressure over a certain amount of time and that would give you a positive pressure breath that is pressure controlled. So what this represents is really what a mechanical ventilator does. The mechanical ventilator exerts energy only during inspiration and during expiration it's a passive process where there's recoil of the lungs and then that becomes expiration keep this model in mind because it's going to help us as we move forward and of course you could titrate respiratory rate by doing it faster or whatever minute ventilation you want to do the point being is that this is a very simple way to think about the ventilator it's a stupid machine that pushes air into people's lungs and to that end we talked about the rule of twos last week when we spoke about respiratory failure. And we're going to build on the rule of twos when we're talking about mechanical ventilation. But I want to give you a new rule, the 3T rule. These three T's are going to help you with any mode of mechanical ventilation. And these are the only three T's you have to remember. And they may be called differently when you read textbooks, but this is how I remember it. Every mode of ventilation has to have something triggering the ventilator to initiate a breath. Every mode of ventilation has a target that you are going to be targeting. It could be pressure, it could be volume, it could be a flow. And then you have to tell that ventilator when you want to turn off that action, when you want to turn off inspiration so that expiration can begin. So remember, trigger, what's your target, and when are you going to terminate that breath? So let's start off with the trigger. Again, every mode of ventilation, you have to define who's going to be triggering the ventilator. Is it going to be the patient or is it going to be the vent? Is it human or is it machine? And for that, we decide assist or control. Assist modes of ventilation are those where the patient initiates the breath and control modes are where the ventilator determines things. The assist mode of ventilation, what you have on every ventilator is you have either a pressure trigger or a flow trigger. So the pressure trigger detects when the person is taking a breath in. It detects that there is someone trying to breathe, a negative deflection, and it opens up the valve for inspiration. Well, there's also a flow trigger. There's usually two limbs of the ventilator where air is blowing around in a circle. And when the person takes a breath, it breaks that flow and it tells the ventilator this person would like a breath. So it assists them by giving them a breath. That is a person or patient derived variable. On the other hand, you might have patients who are paralyzed or deeply sedated that are not triggering the vent. This is where you're going to put the vent in full control here. And what you're going to do is you're putting the vent on a timer. If you have someone who's breathing at a rate of 10, every six seconds, you're going to tell the ventilator to fire off a breath to that person. So this is a control mode. The vent is controlling the respiratory rate. You are determining how often you want that breath to be delivered. So that's trigger. 
every mode of ventilation, you have to figure out who is triggering that breath. The next thing is what is your target going to be? Is it going to be pressure or is it going to be volume? Now there is a flow, um, there is a flow component to the, pr to the volume, but just go with volume for just a little bit. Now people argue about this in critical care and emergency medicine all the time. They say, you must ventilate people with a pressure mode of ventilation. And then other people say, no, you must use the volume. And then some people say, when you have really stiff ARDS, it must be a pressure or volume. Let me tell you something. It's all nonsense. Pressure and volume are directly related. When you pick a mode of ventilation, when you pick a volume or a pressure as being your target, that becomes your independent variable. So if I pick a volume mode of ventilation, because many of us think in terms of volume, you say I want eight cc's per kg, that's my volume. Well, that's your independent variable. What you have to do after a couple breaths is see what your plateau pressure is. You have to make sure that your plateau pressure is under 30, it's safe, because that's your dependent variable. You can't just set the volume and walk away. On the other hand, you might try to be clever and say, well, if 30 is my goal, then I'm going to set it to 29. I'm going to set my pressure to 29 and let the person breathe. Well, you still have to go back and check your dependent variable. And your dependent variable is going to be volume in this case. And you have to make sure that your volume is 8 cc's per kg. So what I'm trying to get at is that there's no way of getting around pressure or volume. One is going to be your independent variable, and you always have to check your dependent variable. And that's why it doesn't really matter. At the end of the day, what matters is you keep your plateau pressures less than 30 and you aim for ideal body weight. And ideal body weight is based on your height and your gender, your height and your sex. So um, you can go through tables, you go through calculations. I never memorize any of this stuff. But the point here is that look at a table and prescribe the tidal volume that you need. If it's in your independent variable, then you're going to go for that. If your pressure is your independent variable, then you're going to make sure that your tidal volumes fall within this range, but you can't get away from it. Sex and height. All right, so that's what we're targeting, pressure or volume. And then finally, you have to tell the ventilator when to turn off, when it's done its job for inspiration, and then it's time for expiration. And so we have to figure out what our inspiratory time is. Now, if you're sitting here breathing and you're not running a marathon, more likely than not, you're breathing at a rate of one to three, maybe one to four. What I mean by that is your respiratory cycle has a smaller fraction of inspiration than it does in expiration. We spend more time expiring than we do inhaling. That's just the normal respiratory cycle. That's just how our physiology is. So when we tell the ventilator we have to terminate, we're only going for that smaller variable there. We're only telling the vent when they want to turn off because, again, expiration is a passive recoil process of the chest wall and the lungs. Now, when we're dealing with volume, we're just telling the vent turn off when a certain volume has been delivered. So is this 500 cc's of, of tidal volume? Well, after 500 cc's has been delivered to the patient, is going to turn off and allow expiratory phase to begin. When we're in a pressure mode of ventilation, this is the part you got to wrap your brain around. In a pressure mode of ventilation, what happens is it's a time variable. So if you have a certain pressure, let's say you set your pressure control to 15, well, you have to tell the vent how long you want to hold that pressure for. It's like if you have a balloon and you're trying to blow it up, if you hold it for just 0.1 seconds, you're hardly going to get any volume. But if I hold it for one full second, I'm going to get a much bigger volume. So when you prescribe pressure as your independent variable, you have to tell the vent how long that's going to be. And usually that's between 0 0.8, 0 0.9, 1 seconds. Finally, I'm going to just touch upon pressure support. And if it's something that's interesting to you, we can talk about it during the discussion section. But when we talk about pressure support, what this does is it tells the ventilator, provide a certain pressure, but once the person reaches a certain threshold or percentage of flow, the ventilator decides to turn off. Usually that flow is about 25% of the patient's effort. So remember, this is the third T. When do you tell the ventilator to turn off inspiration? Is it a volume? Is it a time? Or is it a flow? Let's talk a little bit about cycle time, and let's deep dive this concept a little bit more. Cycle time is the amount of time, the package of inspiration and expiration. So if you have somebody who's breathing at a rate of 15, 60 divided by 15 is four. And what that means is 
just assuming that your inspiratory time is one second, more or less, we'll just round up, that means you spend one part in inspiration and three parts in expiration for each respiratory package or cycle. Now, normally that's okay. That gives you enough time to get the air out before it's time for a fresh, set of, for a fresh bolus of air to get down your airways. But let's change it up a little bit. Let's talk about if you have a respiratory rate of 20. So 30, 60 divided by 20 is now 3. That means that your package, your respiratory package, is 3. And again, keeping with the one second inspiration, now you have a shorter time of expiration. Now, many of us who are not suffering from any obstructive lung diseases or asthma can do this okay, but the asthmatic can't do that. The tight asthmatic, the person who presents to you acutely in the hospital, they need more time in expiration. And so playing with that expiratory time is going to be so vital for those patients. Look at this waveform over here. I don't, we'll talk a little bit about waveforms in the second part of this. But what I want you to look here is at this flow waveform. This is a volume mode of ventilation. It's a volume mode of ventilation because we have a constant flow happening up here. What I want to show you is everything above the baseline is pressure going or flow going from the ventilator towards the patient. And then everything below the baseline is from the patient right back to the ventilator. And I want you to notice here, at the end of every expiration in a normal patient, because this is a normal patient, you'll see that flow comes back to zero. There's an equalization of flow, flow is back to zero, and that's normal. Well, look what happens here. This is an asthmatic who's tachypnic. Air goes in, no problem. But look what happens during expiration. During expiration, what happens is that the flow is not getting back to baseline. It's not getting back to zero. And this leads to breath stacking, auto peep, dynamic hyperinflation, whatever synonym you want to call it. Air is stuck in the lungs, and this causes problems. This happens again with your asthmatics, your COPD patients. This happens iatrogenically. When we intubate somebody, if you have a difficult airway or just the situation is tense, sometimes you're sitting there bagging away and everyone's high-fiving. You don't realize that you're bagging too fast. There are studies that show that in acute resuscitation, people are bagging as fast as 60 breaths per second. That means that the patients are hardly having any time to exhale. So we can do this iatrogenically. And then don't forget, we could do this if we have somebody who has a metabolic acidosis and you're trying to compensate for them on the ventilator. You might try to crank up that respiratory rate, but don't forget that cranking up that respiratory rate only works up to a point, and then you start causing breath stacking. And breath stacking can not only cause lung injury, but it can also cause hemodynamic problems. Because the more air you have building up in that chest, the more positive pressure you have in that chest. And the more positive pressure you have in that chest, the more it compresses down the great vessels, decreasing filling, and ultimately that can lead to hypovolemia relative to the heart and obstructive shock. So it's a bad thing. So remember, patients can do it based on their pathophysiology, but we can do it as well iatrogenically. So bag slowly post-intubation, even if it's a code, bag slowly. And then remember, you have to look at that flow waveform when you're titrating your respiratory rate and try not to go to the point where you start to have auto peep. So that's how we determine termination of the breath. So those are the three T's. Knowing the target for every mechanical breath, um, sorry, knowing the trigger for what the mode of ventilation is going to do, who's going to trigger it, patient or the machine, knowing what the target's going to be, is it going to be pressure or volume, and then telling the ventilator when it's going to terminate. So those are the rules of the game. Once you know those rules, you're going to be good. But now let's go through the modes of ventilation and see how this all plays out. So we're going to go to some basic vent modes. And these are probably some of the modes that you use in your institution. Now, just a disclaimer, I don't have every word jargon, every acronym that's out there. But these are all sort of the same. And there's been a big outcry. Uh, for people like me who are practical to say there needs to be uniformity amongst the different companies to come up with names that are the same because many times you learn a different name and it's actually the same mode of ventilation. So we can talk about this during the discussion if there's any issues. But just remember, there's th these modes of ventilation. Uh, a lot of times they're the same modes with just different names. All right, so let's get at it. Assist control ventilation, the trigger when you have a patient who's sedated and paralyzed, is going to be in the machine. You set a respiratory rate, and the machine is going to deliver that breath for the person. The target is going to be whatever you want it to be. If you want volume to be your independent variable, then volume is going to be your target. If pressure is your independent variable, then 
then pressure is going to be your target. And then when you terminate that breath, it's going to be determined on which one you picked before. So if it's volume, when that volume has been delivered, the breath will terminate. If it's pressure that you picked as your independent variable, then the breath will terminate after that certain amount of eye time, the inspiratory time that you prescribe. It's in there. It's under the hood of the vent, but it's when that breath turns off. All right. So let's talk about assist control ventilation. And what we're going to do here, if technology doesn't fail me, come on, Apple, you got this. Jeez, always with this thing. All right, I'm going to try and sync the Bluetooth pen here. If it doesn't work, we have contingencies. All right. All right, not working. Let's see if I could do it with my finger. All right, let's see what we can do here. Okay, so, yes, it worked. Here we go, here we go. Here's what's gonna happen. When you have somebody who's assist control ventilation, what you do is the person, the breath, the machine delivers that breath and the breath goes in. We'll just talk volume for right now, just easier to talk about. And then the next breath happens because the person's paralyzed. Let's say later on in time, the person, uh, the paralysis wears off. And what happens after that? Well, the paralysis wears off and the person takes a breath right there. The person can initiate a breath on their own, but the breath that they get is exactly the same as the previous breath. If you use 500 cc's of vital volume, it's gonna deliver 500 cc's because the machine just detected a breath. And so when the next breath is due, it'll also deliver the breath. And what could happen is that this person can have um, dyssynchrony because they can start breath stacking. They can breathe on top of the ventilator. Um, they can get respiratory alkalosis because this person now is way over breathing the vent. But when they're fully paralyzed, the vent will deliver that breath at whatever set respiratory rate you prescribed. All right, let's talk about the next mode of ventilation that came along, and that's called synchronized intermittent mandatory ventilation, or SIMV, or SIMV, however you want to say it. This was the next progression in technology where ventilator companies started to do microprocessors, and the ventilators could start reacting, to be teleologic about it, to what the patients were doing. Now here's what happened. If you had a patient that was paralyzed, and let's just say you had your respiratory rate set at 10, and your tidal volume set at 500, okay? So when the person is paralyzed, what happens is the breath goes in, it's 500 cc's. It's time for the next breath, 500 cc's. If the person wakes up, the paralysis w wears off, and the person initiates a breath, the ventilator catches itself, says, no, uh, 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 I'm not giving you a breath because it's not time for a breath just yet. So the person has to pull through that straw through the tubing if they want a breath and they exert a lot of energy in this breath and then of course when it's time for another breath the machine will deliver that full breath the 500 cc's respiratory rate of 10. now if the person starts initiating the breath kind of right here some millisecond before that breath was going to be prescribed the machine will count it towards the prescribed breath but the point here is that the machine is synchronized with what the patient is doing. It's listening to what the patient is doing, you know, listening to what the patient's doing, and it won't let the patient take a full breath like it did in assist control. If the person wants that breath, they have to pull it all on their own, and then if it's close to the prescribed targets, it'll count that breath towards a mandatory ventilatory breath. Now, the other thing you can do, or what people used to do, was they said, well, that's kind of cruel to make a person breathe. If the person takes a breath, I can give them a little pressure support under that breath and let them get a little bit of tidal volume for every unassisted breath. And this is what was thought to be a weaning mode of ventilation, which is not, but people thought you could wean people this way because you'd have a person on full vent support and you'd start dialing back the respiratory rate and increasing the pressure support. And before long, patients were breathing spontaneously on their own. And when they're breathing spontaneously on their own, then you could just go ahead and extubate them. Doesn't turn out to be the case, but that was the thought process behind all this. Okay, and by the way, you can go back and do all that stuff for pressures. So if we went back, So if we went back here, okay, we can also do the same thing for pressure control. So just realize this is, uh, this is what a pressure waveform would look like. It's kind of a continuous pressure breath. 
continuous pressure breath, continuous breath. What right here what we have is we have this is the pressure above zero, and this is the inspiratory time, the amount of time you're holding that breath open. But just know that it's the same concept for assist control, whether you're doing pressure or whether you're doing volume. So let's move on and talk about some advanced modes of ventilation. And what I told you before is you have to pick your independent variable and you have to pick your dependent variable. Now, what if I told you there's a way you can have your cake and eat it too? And there's a mode of ventilation called PRVC. Again, there are some companies with different names, but this is the concept. Pressure Regulated Volume Control. This mode of ventilation is a pressure mode of ventilation with a twist. Here the trigger is the machine. You set a rate and then the machine will deliver that breath. Of course the patient can breathe underneath and it'll deliver uh, the breath um, uh, unassisted, uh, or I'm sorry, assisted. Uh, the target is pressure. Remember it's a pressure mode of ventilation and because it's a pressure mode of ventilation you're titrating the eye time. But here's the twist. This is like having a mini respiratory therapist sitting inside the patient's lungs. And I'm going to explain what I mean by that. So you go up to the machine, you say, machine, I never want you to exceed a pressure of 30. And you say, machine, I would also like it if you can get me 500 cc's of tidal volume. But don't ever exceed 30. You can go as low as zero for your pressure, but never exceed 30. If you get to 30, then turn off. And I want a tidal volume, if you can, of 500. And the machine goes to work. And here's what happens. The first breath is a test breath. The machine knows nothing about the patient's compliance, knows nothing about the resistance, knows nothing about the patient's physiology. So it has to get to know the patient, just like we got to get to know each other. And so it delivers a very small pressure. Let's just say, I'm making up numbers here, let's just say 10 centimeters of water. So it delivers 10 centimeters of water, and the breath it gets back is 200 cc's. Now, you wanted 500, and it only got back 200. So what do you think the ventilator is going to do on the next breath? it's going to increase the pressure. And let's say it goes up to 15. Now it's getting a tidal volume of 300. Still not good enough, so it'll increase to 19. And then the next breath comes back, and now you're getting closer, you're at 400. It goes up to 23 centimeters of water, and now it gets to 500, and now it's cruising. That's the amount of pressure that it needs. So every breath it gives, it measures the tidal volume, and it makes adjustments. Now, let's say you have a patient that develops a, a tension pneumothorax all of a sudden, and now their lung becomes very, very stiff. Their lung becomes stiff, the next breath goes in, the ventilator sees a pressure of 30, and it can't deliver that breath because it didn't want to exceed 30. So what does it do? The ventilator turns off and it starts scaling back down the pressures again and tries to drive it back up to get to 500 cc's, but it can never cross 30 because that's the parameter that you set for the ventilator. And what that means is that the ventilator is going to cap out at that max pressure, and if it exceeds that pressure, the breath won't be delivered, but it caps out there and says, sorry, buddy, you told me this is as high as we want to go. So the problem, like the good thing about PRVC is it allows the machine to make some independent decisions without the respiratory therapist sitting there following the plateau pressure every breath because it kind of knows the rules of the game. But the other problem with PRVC is if you have a patient who's coughing, who's having a lot of secretions, who's bucking the vent, that machine is going to be chasing every breath. If the person coughs, the pressure goes high, it hits the, the peak alarm, and the breath doesn't get delivered. Remember, when alarms go off, breaths don't get delivered. It's not like the alarm goes off and says, I'm delivering this dangerous tidal volume um, whenever you get around to me. No, the ventilator doesn't deliver that breath. When that alarm goes off, you got to get to that bedside. The vent alarm is maybe the most concerning alarm in all of the ICU because that person's not being ventilated. And I'll come back to that in a little bit. But just suffice to say, if the, pr if the tidal volume perceived is low, it drives up the pressure. If the perceived pressure is too high, it brings back the tidal volume down. And of course, if it's just right, just like Goldilocks, it keeps the pressure right there. One more thing I should tell you is that if the ventilator goes too far, let's say it gives a pressure of 25 and it gets 550, 
cc's of tau volume, it'll bring it back down to a lower number. But it's always kind of a moving target. It always changes on a breath by breath basis. And this is probably the future of mechanical ventilations where you basically put in the parameters for the ventilator and the ventilator does everything. And this is something called closed loop ventilation, which I won't go off on tangent into, but there's some ventilators that have that. And basically what it is, it's an algorithm that the ventilator keeps making adjustments for the patients and starts weaning the ventilator without any input from physicians, nurses, respiratory therapists. And uh, unfortunately for job security, I hate to say it, but these closed loop ventilator circuits have been better than human beings, which kind of makes sense because once three o'clock in the morning and we're starting to wind down with stuff, those ventilators are still actively thinking and challenging the patients. Again, maybe a talk for a different day. Let's finish up and talk about uh, APRV, or inverse ratio ventilation. Now, this has come up a lot because of COVID, because there's a lot of ARDS, and this is a different way of ventilating patients. This is inverse ratio ventilation. So you're basically, instead of spending more time during expiration and a little time during inspiration, we're going to spend a lot of time during inspiration and a little time during, um, during expiration. And that's the concept. That's the concept of airway pressure release ventilation or inverse ratio now here's what happens with this this is how it looks i'll decipher this but here what happens is that we have a mean airway pressure the ventilator when it starts inspiration it pressurizes the airway to some high pressure 25 centimeters of water 30 centimeters of water and it keeps that airway open for a long period of time now, what that does is for patients who have dense ARDS where there's a lot of atelectasis, it opens up those lungs over time and then holds them open and splints them open. That's why it's called open lung ventilation. You're holding the lung open and you're ventilating during these brief periods over here where the pressure drops in the lungs and that allows CO2 clearance. Because if you kept the person's airway open infinitely, you'd oxygenate them well, but CO2 is going to build up. So here you keep them open so that they better oxygenate, but then you have these brief releases where CO2 can be cleared out and then the lungs open up again. That's APRV. The other thing about APRV is as patients are getting better, they start to take spontaneous breaths on top of these high pressures. And this is what's believed to keep these people's diaphragms working better and control their their clearance. I'm not going to deep dive this topic um, very much. Maybe in the Q&A we can talk about it. But that's the concept of APRV. You're setting the pressure high. It's a pressure mode of ventilation. So you set your high pressures, you set your lower end of pressures, and you set the times for each one of those. So when you're talking about APRV, the trigger is the ventilator. The ventilator, it's all timed. The spontaneous breaths, they happen, but they're essentially not effective breaths initially. But this mode of ventilation, the machine determines all the timing, everything. You're determining, you're setting in all these parameters. You're setting a, a T high, the amount of time it's being held high, and the T low, the amount of time it's being held low. The target, it's a pressure target. There's no volumes here. You, the volumes will be a dependent variable. You'll see how much volumes are coming out of the patient, but the target is, is pressure. That's what you're titrating. And then you're holding your pressures for a certain amount of time. That's when you tell the ventilator to terminate that breath or essentially have those release ventilations. And you might have heard this term before. I'm just going to say it. It's a kind of goofy term, but those are your dump times. Always makes me laugh. I don't know why. But your dump times are your ventilation. Very small, brief periods of time where the lung volumes come down, not to complete collapse, but just enough to ventilate out CO2 and then right back up to holding up that person for a prolonged period of time. So let's just go through a few cases, make sure we seal this up. And I'll move very quickly through this because I just want you to get the concepts here. If you have a patient who has angioedema and you intubate them for airway protection, their lungs are good, their brain is good. It's just that there's something right here in between. And for those people, the trigger, once the paralysis wears off for intubation, is going to be the patient. I'll let the patient determine their trigger. Just put in their hands. Maybe they go on a pressure support where they determine their, their trigger for breath. Target can be a volume, could be a pressure, whatever you want it to be. And terminating the breath is going to be contingent on whichever you pick. If it's a pressure mode ventilation, then it's going to be the amount of time that goes by. Someone like this, dense ARDS, something we're seeing a lot of during this COVID time. These lungs suck. I don't want this person breathing. I'm giving them a rest. I want them to uh, not cause any ventilator-induced lung injury. 
or 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 P silly or what, whatever you want to call it, Vili. Point here is that this person needs to breath. I want to ventilate them completely, and for that, I'm going to titrate into the machine when to trigger that breath. The target pressure volume, again, it doesn't matter. People who are big ARDS uh, people argue pressure, a, a debate for a different day, and then terminating is going to be dependent on which one you picked for your second variable. Everyone has a Joey alcoholic that comes into the ED. Um, those people sometimes ingest multiple substances, and sometimes they need a breathing tube. For those people, they may be so somnolent that their lungs are okay, they need airway protection, but their brains initially are not so good. And for those people, initially, you'll set the ventilator to trigger the breath. But as they wake up, then you can start pulling back the ventilator and maybe transitioning more to a patient-determined trigger. And I want to end up here with some troubleshooting for ventilators because this is also an area where people get hung up, and I don't want it to be an area of confusion. Um, at the beginning of the year, um, last July 1st, we had uh, a bunch of new um, interns coming in. And this is, for those of you who are in academia, this is the best way to teach ventilators is to get everyone in front of the ventilator and have everyone participate. And I'll, I'll never forget, we had a the, the bunch of interns and some, some residents, some really senior ones, and we're standing in front of the vent alarming. And I was like, this is perfect. Vent alarming, it's an emergency. Let's get everyone to the bedside and do some teaching. And so we're all standing in front of the ventilator. I said, look at this ventilator. Look at these waveforms. The vent is alarming. What do you want to do? And I looked at the senior residents because I figured they'd be the ones who nailed it. Not a single senior resident said anything. I looked at the the second years nothing it was only one intern who stepped forward and she pushed the silent button and then she backed up into line and i gotta tell you that's a hundred percent the wrong answer but that that resident so clever to think of that and that's what we all do we always push the silent alarm but i gotta tell you like i said before when you push that silent alarm all you're doing is you're just hushing the vent down you're not fixing the problem and when that vent is alarming it's telling you i did not deliver what you wanted me to deliver. I had to shut off because I've exceeded some safety parameter. So for all the alarms you hear in the ED, in the ICU, in the OR, the vent alarm is the one that should be the most concerning because that means the person is not ventilating. I mean, if your blood pressure is 40 over zero, that's bad too. But vent alarm, get on that as quick as you can. And what I want to do is give you a sequence for what you can do when you have that vent alarm and just keep it really, really simple. If you go simplistically like this, you're gonna get at most of the problems that are troubling your patient when that vent is alarming. So whenever someone comes up and says the peak pressure is high, you gotta know what the plateau pressure is. You can't just operate knowing what peak pressures are. The peak pressure is all the pressure in the airway during inspiration and just to keep it brief, it's the summation of the resistance of airflow and the compliance of the chest wall. The resistance component is the airflow going through the endotracheal tubes, the trachea, the main bronchi, the bronchioles, all that stuff before the alveoli. It also means the tubing in the ventilator system. That's the resistance to airflow. That is part of the peak pressure. The compliance of the system is the lungs, how stiff they are from ARDS, pneumonia, pneumothorax, but it's also the chest wall. It's also the abdominal compartments pushing up. It's so many things put together that makes up the compliance. And when you see the peak pressure that's elevated, you don't know what's what. It's kind of everything snowballed into one. You just know that something in the system is high. It's one, it might be the resistance, might be the compliance, it could be both, you don't know. So that's why it's so imperative to ask the question, whenever you're told that the peak pressure is high, what is my plateau pressure? What a plateau pressure is, is this inspiratory hold. So as the person is getting a breath, you put the inspiratory hold on, and that ceases airflow in the system. Without any airflow, that means there's no resistance. You need airflow to create resistance. But if there's zero airflow, there's no resistance. And that means the only thing left over is the stiffness, compliance of the lung, the chest wall, the abdominal compartment. And that's why plateau pressures are so important. So remember, peak pressures are everything, and plateau pressures are just the compliance. And knowing that, you can troubleshoot what's going on with your patient. So for example, if you have a patient whose peak pressure is equal to the plateau pressure 
that should tell you that the problem is simply a problem of compliance because there's almost no resistance playing a role in that elevated peak pressure, right? Peak and plateau are almost the same. Now, it'll never be exactly the same, but if it's off by five, that's good enough. But if you have a peak pressure that's 50 and your plateau pressure is 47, that tells me it's a compliance problem. It's a stiff lung problem. And I start going through the algorithm of what could be causing that. Is it that we gave that person 86 liters of fluid to resuscitate them and now their lungs are so soggy and wet and they're stiff to ventilate? Is the person getting worsening ARDS? Did the resident sneak in, try to do central line, not get in, sneak out, and cause a pneumothorax? Certainly could be part of the cause. And is there any neuromuscular problems? Maybe the person um, is having, you know, you intubated them for myasthenia gravis, let's just say, and um, they, um, they're having a stiff chest wall problem where their, their chest wall is rigid and they can't be ventilated. But the point here is it's not a resistance problem. It's a stiffness of the lung problem. If your peak pressures are greater than your plateau pressures, so if my peak pressure is 50 and my plateau pressure is 26, that tells me there's a resistance component that's causing this problem, a resistance problem. And that means that the patient could be maybe biting on the tube. Maybe the tube is too small. Maybe there's a mucus plug somewhere in the system. Maybe that asthmatic didn't get their continuous nebulization, or maybe they need more. Maybe there's bronchoconstriction. But what this does is allows me to focus down and focus on which half of the problem is. Is it a resistance problem that I need to work down or is it a compliance problem? So remember peak and plateau. Now, you got to know this, that when you're doing these measurements, this can't be a person who's actively bucking and coughing on the ventilator. When you do these measurements, you need the patient to be somewhat calm. You may even have to give them a little bolus of sedation or, or, set, uh, or analgesic to get this because these numbers are contingent on the patient activity. I want the patient out of the picture. So I give them the sedative, I give them the analgesics, and then I do my measurements, and that's usually what comes back and helps me out with that patient. So we're going to do Q&A after this, but let me just bring this all back home, and let's just do a summary. Ventilators can be very, very tricky, but I don't want you to get hung up in all of the confusion of what they are. Remember, it's all about the three T's. Know whatever ventilator mode someone throws at you, Ask yourself, who is triggering the ventilator? Is it the patient or is it the machine? Ask yourself what mode of ventilation, or what, the, what they're targeting in the mode of ventilation. Is it a pressure or is it a volume? And ask, what is the parameter that turns off that breath? Because expiration is a passive process. All we're titrating for, all we're telling the ventilator to do is provide inspiration, and that's what we're titrating. And then remember about that relationship between the peak and the plateau pressure when the vent is alarming. Never let that vent alarm when you have a patient who is sick. That should be your first priority. But go through peak and plateau and troubleshoot your way backwards. If the peak is greater than the plateau, then it's a resistance problem. If your peak is equal to your plateau, then it's a stiffness of the chest wall, of the lung, abdominal compartment. Something is at play there. So I hope that makes it clear that's certainly the way I think about mechanical ventilation and whenever I have a mode that I'm trying to work through, and I hope it helps you as well. And let me turn it over here to the chat window and see what's going on. And let's say hi to a couple people. Um, let's see. B4's Duds3, what's up? And what's up? Matthew Miller. Rishi. All right, my man. Uh, that's right. So Rishi attests, and he's way smarter than me. So there's uh, a lot of different names for the same vent mode. Um, we got uh, Steve Steve Velasquez on here. Thank you for that. Bedside rounds. What's up, my man? I appreciate that. Angela says you can't make this analysis in pressure ACV. One of the reasons I prefer volume control. Oh, so I I presume that we're talking about plateau pressures, and that's right. So Angel's point or in, in hell, I don't I want to pronounce your name right, is you can't do a plateau pressure in a pressure mode of ventilation. So you, you to do a plateau pressure, you need there to be a cessation of volume. Um, so volume mode of ventilation, you can hold the flow, and then it gets you to your plateau pressure. Now, with pressure control, when you're saying your pressure control, you don't know exactly what the plateau pressure is because that peak pressure is your peak inspiratory pressure. So it's a summation of everything. So it's true you don't know exactly what your plateau pressure is, but if you set your peak pressure to 20, 
you can say with certainty, with confidence, that your plateau pressure is not greater than 20 because that's the maximum pressure in the system. I hope that makes sense, but that's an excellent point. Thanks for doing that. Um, volume modes, if you ever wanna do a plateau pressure, just flip over to volume mode, get your plateau pressure, and then you can go back to pressure controlled. Um, Lily G says, what's the best vent mode for asthma or COPD exacerbation? There is none. I, the point is, is that pressure or volume is fine either way. What's most important when you have somebody who has a restrictive uh, lung disease, asthma or COPD, is they need more time in expiration. And for that, you want to crank down your respiratory rate. And sometimes you'll have to sedate people deeply. Rarely you have to paralyze them. But you want to dial down your respiratory rate because when you dial down your respiratory rate, our inspiratory time is fixed. I mean, we could play with it, but let's just assume it's fixed. It's that one second. So when we had that person who was breathing at a rate of 20, we have one second for inspiration and two seconds for expiration. We dial that down to 10. We'll get extreme here. Now we have one second of inspiration and five seconds for expiration. So dialing down the respiratory rate gives you more expiratory time. And that's really what you're looking for in terms of your mode, a low respiratory rate. Pressure, volume, it honestly doesn't matter. And we can debate that and argue that all day long. Matt Goebel's up in here. Can you discuss optimizing PEEP? Um, balancing PEEP, plateau, driving pressure, assist control. Yeah. Um, oh, and uh, B4's Duds3 says, my name is Sergio. What's up, Sergio? All right, so back to Matt's question. This is a great point because driving pressure is a newer concept that's, that's been coming up. And um, I'm just going to give a little shout out to myself. We did a little driving pressure on TikTok, and I am going big on TikTok. I promise, Matt, I'm going to get back to your question. But TikTok is not just about teenagers and, and people who are scantily clad and doing crazy things. I mean, there's plenty of that on TikTok, but it's also an underutilized, amazing educational platform. Uh, I say educational because there's lots of people who are in business and finance and marketing who are on there giving crazy good little videos. And my thought is, why not do it for medical education? Now, I'm not that smart. But I got to tell you, there's not that many people doing medical education. I mean, there's people in scrubs who are dancing on TikTok, but there's very few people who are actually making educational content. And there are some, and they're on Instagram, and they're my friends. But my goal is to push that platform because I truly believe that short format of education can be huge. So why am I telling you all this? Well, I'm telling you all this because I made a TikTok on driving pressures, but I'll talk about it here. But I'm also doing it because in June, I'm going to be doing one TikTok a day and for the entire month, and I'm not going to be posting an Instagram, and I'm going to try and build up that platform and get a couple more people on there to try and teach using TikTok. So if you're not on TikTok, I'm going to say it, download the app, sign up for it, because I'm going to be putting out what I think are some pretty good pearls on there. Um, and they'll be entertaining as well, because I think education and entertainment are intertwined, but, um, but they won't be silly and stupid, I hope. I, I vet them with my wife first, and she tells me if it's stupid. So you can go to TikTok, you can sign up um, and get some of those pearls. So all of that to, to, to shameless plug, but Matt, your question, driving pressure. Here's how many people are adjusting the ventilator for people. Once you get somebody intubated, the thought was is that if you keep your plateau pressure less than 30, you're good. It doesn't matter what your PEEP is, as long as your plateau is less than 30, you're good. 68 cc's per kg, all that stuff. That was from the arts and trial. And someone by the name of Mato came by and said, well, wait a minute, let's, let's look at this. And started looking at this thing called driving pressure. Driving pressure is simply the plateau pressure that you measure on the ventilator minus your PEEP. And what was noticed looking at large databases of patients, including the ARDSNET trial, is that when your driving pressure is less than 15, it was associated with a better mortality. If your driving pressure is greater than 50, you start to have an increased mortality. And they went back and they looked at people in the ARDSNET trial whose initial plateaus were less than 30, which everyone thought that's pretty good, right? That's what we want. But their driving pressures were elevated. And what they found is that when their driving pressures were elevated, even though the plateaus were less than 30, there was an associated mortality with that. And what that means is that the driving pressure, the sheer force as you're pushing air into that airway might be more important than the plateau pressure. This mic is a mind of its own. So what does that mean? When I intubate a person, 
my first goal is to start them with the peep that they need. So I'll start with a five of peep. If they're morbidly obese, pregnant, or, or something else, I might start them a little higher, let's say seven. And as they need more oxygenation, I'll increase my peep up, and I'll keep an eye on my plateau pressure. If my initial PEEP is 5 and my plateau pressure is 30, well, that tells me that my driving pressure is 25. That's not good. What I need to do is increase my driving pressure, and I'll keep creeping up that driving pressure until I get to a point where that driving pressure is about 15. It doesn't always happen, but if I can get there, that's a good thing for that patient, and we keep that driving pressure less than 15, and hopefully that de decreases the shear force. And I start to recruit lung that was de-recruited, and you try to find that right compliance curve. Um, there's a video I have with, um, with Matt Shuba on uh, managing the refractory hypoxemic patient. It's on this channel. It's fire. It's so good. Matt is such a genius. He explains it very, very well. I'd recommend if you're talking about setting ventilators for patients in ARDS, watch that because it, it kind of goes beyond the scope of this. But that's how I do it. I start my PEEP lower. Um, and I drive it up until I get to my driving pressure uh, is, is in that less than 15 range. Always trying to keep it less than 30, but most importantly, less than 30 with a high driving pressure is not a good thing for patients either. So I hope that explained it. Just hit me back uh, if it doesn't. Bedside rounds. Haney, do you do math to figure out the patient's starting tidal volume on the initial vent settings, or do you have general numbers then adjust later? It's a great question. Um, I, I, I hate math. Um, but I do it. What I, what I find is that no one knows the height of the patient. So we have tape measures, disposable tape measures. We measure the person up and I get a, I get a table out. We have it on the back of our cards laminated. The other thing I do is I just pull up a, um, I pull up an MD calc and I just type it all in there. Simple, simple. And I don't have to do any math. And what I do though, is I make the goalposts six to eight cc's per kg. If it's an ARDS patient, I'll have four and I'll write it on the glass. This way we don't have to go back and calculate again. We have four, five, six, seven, and eight. We know what those tidal volumes are for that person. And then we know where to go to. And then when I look at the ventilator, I can just look at the glass and see where they are in terms of tidal volume. So I hope that's helpful to you. Um, Caleb says, when do you know to switch to less intensive forms of ventilation? What are you looking at in order to start weaning your patient? And what's the best mode to wean on? The best, so that's a great question. Uh, there's no real formula for it. Essentially what you're doing is if you have a patient who's sick, you're looking to see that their oxygenation is improving. You're looking to see that your PEEP is coming down if your PEEP was higher. And then every day you should be pausing your sedation and your analgesia, and you want to get your patients more awake, and you do an awakened breathing trial, um, and then you do a spontaneous breathing trial at that point. Now, I'll be honest with you, in these COVID times where patients are so sick, there are days where we don't do spontaneous awakening, and that's just because they're so sick, and we know based on their physiology from yesterday, they're not going to be better. But as those patients get better, as we start weaning stuff down, then we start to titrate down their PEEP and their oxygenation. And once their FiO2 is less than 60, their PEEP is down to some reasonable number, 8, 7, 6, whatever number you like to go, then you could start putting them on an SBT, a, spontaneously, a spontaneous breathing trial. What you do there is you put the patient on pressure support and you let them breathe and you watch them breathe. You watch the tidal volumes you're taking, you watch to see how anxious they are, you look at their blood pressure, you look to see if they're tachycardic, you look for something called RISB, um, a bunch of different parameters just to make sure that the person is fit for getting extubated. And if all those check out, the patient has a cough, they have mental status, then that might, and a, a cuff leak, that might be someone you proceed for extubation. So hopefully that helps answer your question. All right, and Steve Velasquez, who's a realtor, says, TikTok is the future of information dissemination. Done. I'm done here. I'm done. Get Because Steve Velasquez says it. Get on TikTok right now. At Critical Care Now. Sign up. The other thing I didn't want to tell you because I didn't want to sound like a salesperson, but I'm going to say it right now. I'm trying to get to 1,000 followers just for one simple reason. I've never been a follower count person. I mean, it's nice when you know that people are appreciating your content and out there, but I'm not like big into numbers. I'm happy that 17 of you are here watching. I'm happy. I'm happy if one of you showed up and I could teach one person. That's always been the way I've conducted myself. But if you get to a thousand followers on TikTok, then you can do live TikToks. And if we can do live TikToks, there's some pretty cool stuff that we can do, including raising money and fundraisers and all that type of stuff. So I'm really psyched and I'd like to get there. So 
I don't care if we get to a thousand and that's it. I just want to get to a thousand so that we can start doing some really good fundraising stuff and some other really cool charitable type behaviors, which um, are harder to do on these platforms. So I'm just throwing it out there. All right, but thanks, Steve. I appreciate that. Uh, Sergio asks, in the patients with ARDS, is there a theoretic benefit of adjusting settings when interventions such as proning along with medications such as Flolin are invented? Um, when patients are being proned, you eventually want to start dialing down the PEEP. That's probably the only vent setting you're really working on. Um, it's uh, There's no set way of doing it. Everyone has a slightly different way of doing it. But what I would say is that after you prone the person, um, you start pulling back their settings. And then when you supinate them, you see how they resolve with that. If the patients are getting better with that during supination, then you're doing the right things. Matt says, empiric tidal volume. I did some math on this the other day based on ultra, uh, U.S. height average and distribution for the target of 60 cc per kg. 450 for men, 350 for women would be about 50 plus minus 50 cc's for 68% of the population once they're in deviation. So if you think your patient is about average height, those can be reasonable to start with before you have time to measure height. That's absolutely true. That's absolutely true. So to Matt's point, if you were to say you're an average height female, just go for 350, you'd be in the ballpark. And if you're an average height male, just go for 450. That's all true. But what I would argue is that while initially post-intubation, the respiratory therapist is asking you for, uh, for what tidal volume, if you want to go with that, that's fine. But I hardly see a reason not to go figure out in the next half hour to an hour what their ideal body weight is. I mean, it really is just a tape measure. I mean, we send people for MRIs and CT scans and put all sorts of stents into people's aortas. We can measure how tall people are and outsource it. Put it on your respiratory therapy team. Put it on your nurses. Sorry, nurses. But it, it's something that I think we should do. I mean, I do it myself. I, I, I get a tape measure when I see everyone working, and I just measure the person myself. It's really not that hard to do. But to Matt's point, yes, that would be a good range. Um, and it also speaks to the point that when you have a patient, here's a fun fact for you. Do you know that every BVM that you have has a prescribed tidal volume that's in it? And on the bag, it'll actually say one hand of ventilation gets you a certain tidal volume, two hand bag gets you another tidal volume. For most bags that I'm familiar with, two hands gets you at least a liter, if not higher. Some are 1.2, 1.3 liters with two hands. And, and most people post intubation because of the adrenaline rush are bagging with two hands. So that's way too much tidal volume. But even one-handed bags gets you 500 cc's of tidal volume, and that's likely too much. So here's an interesting trick that you can consider. A pediatric bag has a maximum tidal volume, some of them, most of them, about 500 cc's. And if we're saying that most people unless you're nine feet tall, most people, the higher end would be 500 cc's. Should we be having all our BVMs be pediatric bags? I'm going to let you think about that. But if you have a situation where it gets chaotic, where people are bagging crazy, or it's a cardiac arrest, maybe having a pediatric bag, BVM, might restrict the volume so that even with human error, you can't exceed that level. And if you're going to do that, just remember pediatric BVMs have these pop-off valves. You'll have to take off the pop-off valve for that. But just, just, just food for thought. All right. Um, let's see. Yusuf says, I will make an account in TikTok just to follow you. You're the man. Thank you for that. Oh, I didn't mention that once I get to 1,000, I'm going to randomly pick five people to get the Resus X digital package. Just because. You know what? Make it 10 people. 10 people will get the uh, digital Resus X package once I get to 1,000. So that might be, it might take me six years. And at that point, Resus X, that package will be so old. But I always keep my promises. Uh, Angel says, that's the only reason I downloaded TikTok. All right. You guys are too nice. Too nice. But trust me. Trust me. Don't just follow me. There's a lot of good people out there. Um, there are some good educators. Just surf um, Instagram. There's a few people um, who are doing it, but I suspect more will be doing it. Short format, high educational content. Um, check out my videos and let me know what you think. Maybe I'm totally off on this. I, I think I'm. I think I'm on because sh th with our with our younger learners, short format is right. Um, all right. I got to the bottom of the comments, and there's no more comments. 
anyone else have anything they want to say? We're sort of at the one hour mark. I think that's just the the expiration date for how tired you can get of some guy sitting in an 84 degree office talking to a microphone. But I will stick around for a few more minutes if you have any other questions. This video will be posted on YouTube. So uh, if you have to jump off, that's totally fine. If you've jumped off or you just came on late, don't worry. The video will be on uh, between today and tomorrow morning. You'll be able to watch it. But um, I hope that this video helped to demystify mechanical ventilation for you. It was something that has always troubled me, always made it confusing. And now any mode that gets thrown at me, I can decipher it. I now have the cheat code or the decoder ring to figure out what's going on in that ventilation, and I break it down in that way. All right, we've got one more question here. Lily G, you're welcome. Any recommendations for the use of simple transport ventilators that only allow settings of rate and volume? Um, my only recommendation is just to be sure that you get to six to eight cc's per kg. You don't do too much with the ventilation. Transport vents are what they are, and I know many of you are working in centers where that's all you have available, and that's fine. I don't think you're destroying your patients by doing that, but just remember, um, good vent hygiene, just to make sure that before you put them on the transport ventilator, the transport ventilators, put this the ventilator that they're coming off of on the same settings that you're going to put them on and see how they do with it. Make sure there's no auto peeping because some transport ventilators don't give you those waveforms. Just make sure, check your work to make sure that you're putting them on the appropriate settings and then transport them over on that. But I think if you keep them 6 to 8 cc's per kg, you'll be bueno. Bedside rounds. Can you make a comment about the filters we're using for COVID patients? Um, the viral filters. Um, can you be a little more specific? Um, I'll tell you what I interpret this to be, but please tell me I'm way off. But um, having these filters in line with the BVMs during intubation is is really important. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind is that uh, when you're disconnecting patients after intubation and you're bagging them, you really want to consider clamping the endotracheal tube and removing the exhalation port, putting your vent on standby. Because if you just disconnect the BVM after intubation for these COVID patients, you're just going to get a lot of spray. Of, uh, of aerosolization, but by clamping it, you're holding the spray in, and disconnecting them from the ventilator um, also will cause the spray. So if you're gonna disconnect the person from the vent, be sure that you clamp. Um, be careful with that though, don't just clamp. It can cause injury to the endotracheal tube and also disconnect the exhalation port or put it on standby so it doesn't spray out air. Hopefully that was the question you're asking, um, but, uh, but it looks like you're gonna be more specific with it. Uh, Matthew Miller, are we better off just using a BVM? carefully of course um for transport i would not do a bvm for transport uh, just human error is so big i'm sorry if that wasn't your question if not correct me but that's what i'm reading your question as um there's just too much human error that's why i like to use a pediatric bag it just takes the it just takes human factors out of it sergio thank you i've been trying to really understand vents and you've been oh thanks you're welcome i'm glad it helped rachel you're welcome. Uh, Shamira, I hope I'm saying your name right. I was late, but thanks. We'll watch when uploaded. You are welcome. I hope you have a great weekend. Farhan, can you explain auto flow versus no water flow? Um, maybe you can clarify that, although I am getting towards the end. Let me just read through any other questions. If I have a patient, plateau of 26, uh, exhale, tidal volume, 8.8. .8, CCs. Am I playing lung protective strategy? Ah, I see what you're saying. So lung protective strategy uh, traditionally has been keeping the keeping the plateau pressures less than 30 and using 6 to 8 cc's per kg. The PREVENT trial from last uh, two years ago, year and a half ago, has shown that maybe you don't have to be as tight with your tidal volumes in a non-ARDS patient. So maybe you can go up as high as 10 cc's per kg, and there's a variety of reasons for that. But I would even add in driving pressure as being part of your, as part of your um, lung protective strategy, because without driving pressure, you don't really know if you're being protective of the lung, and that's a, that's a pretty important parameter. On the horizon, there are people talking about mechanical power, and that relates to respiratory rate. Maybe driving a person's respiratory rate too high can be injurious to the lung. Those are things that are, are developing stories, and we'll wait and see. Uh, Matt, you are welcome. 
uh, bets at rounds. Thank you. That's actually what I was hoping for. One more question. Does anyone in your circle run COVID codes using the vent with a closed circuit instead of disconnecting using BVM? Yes. So um, we want to limit disconnections from the vents as much as possible. And I would even argue during a code, run a code on the ventilator. Don't disconnect and bag. Because again, adrenaline is running. People are over bagging. There is evidence that bagging people too fast decreases venous return to the heart, which is decreasing coronary filling, which is why you're doing chest compressions in the first place. So by taking human factors out of it, by limiting smaller tidal ventilations, you can keep patients connected to the ventilator. The nice thing about that is the, the room gets much quieter, people don't freak out, and the machine does it. If you're going to do that, though, remember that as your person is pushing down and doing chest compressions, two things are going to happen. The vent is going to trigger thinking that a breath is needed. And also, if the breath is trying to be delivered as you're pushing down, the ventilator is going to sense that there's an uh, increase in compliance of the lung and may hit the peak alarm. So you got to crank up the peak alarm or the peak pressure alarm so that it doesn't detect downward pressures as, as being a, a, stimulate, a stimulus to stop the mechanical breath. And you want to put them on SIMV because SIMV, what that will do, again, remember, it's synchronized. So it'll only deliver the mandatory breath. So you might set your respiratory rate at a breath rate of 10 during your cardiac arrest. So you set it to 10. So that means 10 breaths. Every six seconds, there's going to be breath. And if there's chest compressions, what will happen is it won't detect that and give it a full mechanical breath. If you just did it on assist control, theoretically what can happen is as the person's releasing, the vent might think, oh, the patient wants a breath and give another breath. And now you're ventilating that patient, you know, um, as fast as the chest compressions, which would be counterproductive. So set your peak pressures high and put them on SIMV. And that's a way you can use the ventilator for your respiratory therapist. And I like to have my respiratory therapist doing other things for me, not just sitting there with a bag. Um, all right, one more question. What do I think about APRV and COVID patients? I think it's okay. Um, there's people out there that are really pushing it. I think there's no one mode of ventilation for one type of patient. There are people that try to say that I use this vent mode for everything, or I use that mode for everything. I could hammer a nail into a wall with a wrench, but it doesn't mean it's a good idea. I have tools known as vent modes, and I use them for whatever situation my patient is in. And that's why it's important to know the different modes of ventilation. That's why it's important not to get stuck on one mode of ventilation and preach it all day long, because you have to know to adapt to what your patient needs. We didn't go into air hunger and titrating flow rates and all sorts of different things that are a, a little more advanced. We want to keep it basic for this lecture. But if a person has stiff lungs and they're de-recruited, that's a person I would consider using APRV for. But a COVID patient who has diffuse patchy infiltrates, who has a good compliance to their lungs where I'm able to ventilate them, I might just go for a conventional form of ventilation. So be very leery whenever someone tells you that this is the vent mode that I use because it works in every patient and there's all sorts of physiologic reasons for it. Vent modes are, are tailored for what the patient's physiology needs. And it's really important to know what your patient needs and then prescribe it exactly for them. And that's something I was taught early on and something I continue to teach other people. All right, let's see. All right, so Farhan says, breath more than six millimeters, six mLs per kg, and I always wonder if the patient breathes over the set tidal volumes, are we still doing lung protective ventilation? No, that's there's actually injury that happens when the patient's breathing too much. So you set a vent mode for the person and the patient's breathing over that, the lungs see what the lungs see. They don't see what you dialed in on the vent. They see what the, the vent is giving them. And so that's this terminology called P silly. I have an Instagram post on it if you want to check it out. But the patient can do harm to themselves, and it's important to be mindful of what the patient is doing. And if you don't, you lose sight of that, that patient can injure their own lungs by taking too much breath, too, too, too large of a tidal volume, or too rapid of a breath. So this is where looking at the patient's waveforms, knowing what they need physiologically, and giving them that, and adjusting their sedation is so vitally important. All right, Farhan, congratulations. You are the last question for this lecture. And with that, I want to thank you all for tuning in to Live at Five. This has been a lot of fun for me. And, uh, you know, Bedside Rounds knows this because he's been helping me. And a big shout out to him for 
for being there and helping me to to fix the audio, fix the video, and to help work through some of these technical glitches. But I've been doing this now for a couple of weeks, and I gotta say, the ones I did a couple of weeks ago were pretty crummy compared to this right now, which I still think is average. But I feel better about the production value, and I feel good about giving you these lectures, and I hope the format is good for you. Go ahead and comment below. Tell me what you think of these. Please let me know what you'd like me to do differently, the things that are done well, and other topics and things that you'd like to see in the future. I am always down for more education. I don't do this to hear myself talk, although my wife says I like to hear myself talk. I'm doing this because you all are out there and you want education, and I'm happy to give it to you because this is the stuff that I love to talk about. So again, please hit me down below. Uh, don't hit me down below. Please comment down below and let me know what you think of the content. Let me know what things could be done better, and let me know about topics that you want to hear in the future. I really want to thank you all for joining me on a Friday afternoon. Friday? When happy hour opens up, I'm pretty sure I'm not going to have as many people hanging out here, but I'll take it. Thank you for hanging out. I'll try to do the crashing asthmatic next week or maybe the week after I just have to check out my schedule but it'll probably be next week and don't forget to sign up from tiktok because that is where educators are heading and that's where i'm going to be all next month in terms of educational content one tiktok a day at least one tiktok a day so thank all the <laughs> thank you to all of you have a wonderful weekend please be safe out there and remember please everyone you stay awesome